Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we have Carly and Megan joining us as compliance technical specialists. They work at Microsoft, and they are in our federal organization. And they're going to help us out with some compliance questions and auditing questions and also some data protections in this new world of AI and large language models and all of that. So I'm going to kick it over to Carly if you want to give an introduction. And then Megan, if you want to follow up, just kind of get, tell us about yourself and your career and your experience. Sure. Hi, I'm Carly. Uh, like you said, I'm a compliance technical specialist. Megan and I like to say it's more data security technical specialist, just because we'll get into it later, the whole compliance versus data security thing. Um, but I've been at Microsoft for a little over a year. Prior to coming here, I was a um, compliance assessor for the federal government, so assessing contractor compliance with cybersecurity requirements within their contracts. Um, and prior to that, I worked in that same agency's IT department doing RMF and um, preparing for different types of audits that they had. So happy to be here and talk this subject. Megan? Yeah, I'm Megan Maley. I am, uh, as Carly said, a compliance technical specialist. Uh, I have been doing compliance type work, cybersecurity type work for the Department of Defense and a little bit in the Intel community for about 10 years before joining Microsoft. I've been with Microsoft for about two and a half years, so just under 13 years all in doing um, cybersecurity, both from the system perspective as well as from the program uh, cybersecurity perspective. So happy to be here. Awesome. So... You mentioned, Carly, that compliance, when we say that word, that might have a different meaning to a lot of folks in the cybersecurity industry because most people immediately think different frameworks like mm -hmm. ISO 27001 or CMMC and things that you have to comply with in these audits. But at Microsoft, Compliance TS has a different meaning. So can you give us an idea of what is all in on, say, your daily job and what you are responsible for? Yeah, sure. So um, like you said, compliance at Microsoft or the compliance TS definition, it covers more than just the compliance frameworks. That's a piece of it. Um, and it's really a smaller portion of like the, you know, tool set um, that we cover is Microsoft Purview. Um, which is why I was saying it's more of like a data security technical specialist. And I think even at Microsoft, we're moving away from that compliance term and more towards data security, just because Purview covers compliance from a like self um, assessment standpoint, but also covers things like information protection, e-discovery. Um, data loss prevention, insider risk management, communications compliance, which really kind of compliance, if you think about it, is just how do you implement different or policies? So that's kind of the difference between, you know, the frameworks are those regulations, like you said, the ISOs, you have CMMC, you have, you know, C, uh, CSSPs and the DOD when it comes to your SOC um, or your cyber operations centers. And so there's tons of different frameworks out there. Or like what what I used to do in the past is, you know, your system um, framework, which is that risk management framework, and how do you implement those different regulations or security tools? Awesome. Both of you guys have a lot of experience <laughs> in the compliance world and auditing. And I think most organizations who fall under some sort of compliance framework usually know that they're in a framework and they have some sort of audit process going, but sometimes there's an M&A or something like that, that all of a sudden now you fall under a specific framework and um, maybe you, you start a, a retail business and you, you start processing credit cards and you fall under PCI or you acquire a healthcare company or something like that. 
um, or you get a government contract and now you fall under different framework like how is the best way and either one you know can jump in here but what is the best way to really start understanding the framework once you are uh, once you fall under that specific framework how do you start preparing for an audit and um, yeah what are the, some of the best practices so I can take this one. There's several ways to go about it. Normally organizations have a pretty good idea of the assessment methodology that they're going to be assessed against. In some cases, it can be an entirely new situation. And my recommendation in those cases is always going to be to lean into a partner that has experience in that assessment methodology. If it's your first time undergoing, like I only deal with DOD customers, right? So if it's their first time undergoing an assessment, this very intelligent to bring in a partner or someone who has experience in the perhaps security ecosystems that you're working with that can uh, help you leverage or turn on the features that are going to help you meet compliance, especially for the first time. Because, you know, anytime we're implementing security measures, it's going to be uh, have a configuration management impact. It has to be recorded. So there's a, a lot to making changes to your environment. Um, for a lot of DOD folks, uh, it's they have been their systems have been operational for longer than the current assessment framework. Great example of that would be when we made the move from DICAP to RMF within the DOD. Uh, DICAP was a series of between 100 and 106 security controls that were very loose in nature. They had a very uh, broad uh, range of interpretation because they weren't like ultra specific. And then when we made the transition into RMF, all of a sudden we got very granular. And Andy, we were talking before the show about how, you know, there can be a very um, expansive room for interpretation of a particular control. You know, when they say MFA, like, what does that mean? Does that mean at the network level? Does that mean at the application level? Um, and so there's even still in RMF, a lot of room for interpretation. And so I think, you know, the best thing to do is to be working with the vendors that are providing the security products that you have in play today uh, to make the most of your current security investments. In the case of something like Microsoft, where we offer the first party GRC tools in platform, Obviously, you know, you can reach back to Microsoft and learn how to make the most of that first party investment, whether that be through Microsoft Defender for Cloud. There's a really uh, cool data security blade that has been lit up recently, whether that be through Purview and the Compliance Manager, uh, or whether that be one of the Sentinel workbooks that centers around CMMC or 853. There's a lot of great ways to turn on the first party um, security things that can help you meet your assessment frameworks. And it's important to note that that can be done through either a Microsoft Forward partner or through reach back to Microsoft um, directly to the vendor. Um, but the, the goal really is when approaching our um, assessment frameworks is we want to make the most of the existing investment, whether that's Microsoft or not, to get you to a place of security as fast as possible. And then from there, we can start looking at the add-ons or the additional investments that you might need to meet any uh, deltas. Go ahead, Carly. I was going to say, um, I agree completely. And like you make a good point in regards to the hiring a partner or a consultant um, especially when it comes to companies that, you know, decide that they want to try and take on government work or healthcare work, um, cause there are things that they did not have to do as a sole private company that now that you're connecting yourself to some of these industries that have, you know, very sensitive information that you are going to be required to protect. And sometimes those companies are super small, um, or they're a very niche company and they have maybe like a handful of IT folk who are just break fix network guys. And so they're not going to necessarily be able to understand or interpret these requirements and would need assistance. Um, but also like as a C-suite realize that you, this is something outside of your grasp and being able to bring in a professional to be able to help you. I mean, there are a few companies that I remember that we assessed that that was the exact scenario is that, you know, from a investment standpoint, paying for cyber can be expensive, but I like to look at it like insurance, like cybersecurity, 
paying for it is going to be cheaper than the ransom or the penalties that you might have to pay if information is leaked and you are the source of that leak, especially when it comes to like export controlled information. There are very, very heavy fines for that. And so this is an inver a vulnerable company. You're going to lose your business. So um, looking for help is where like the easiest answer if you don't know what to do, if you don't know how to understand some of the different frameworks. Because there's, I mean, like Megan was mentioning with like RMF and that switch, like there's hundreds of controls that go into that. And so, and it can be tailored, but how do you know how to tailor? Um, so that's where professionals can come in to assist. Yeah, so like Megan, you talked about interpreting different controls. Can you deviate from controls or maybe document a reasoning for maybe not complying with a control and still pass an audit. One thing that comes to mind is like password rotation. There's a lot of frameworks out there that require you to say, change your password within 90 days or change your password every 180 days or even shorter really. And I know the federal government, cause I actually had access to a federal system up until recently where I just said, I don't need it anymore, but they were changing their password every 60 days up until recently. Is there a way to say, well, NIST no longer recommends password rotation. Here's our password plan, and I'm going to document it for you. And this is the whole, you know, um, documentation of how we handle passwords and when they're compromised and um, when we would rotate them. Is there a way to do that and still pass, or do you have to really stick to that specific 90-day mark or whatever it is? Sure. So it's all about your organization's appetite for risk and the risk is going to correlate directly to the type of information that you're processing and storing. There are two places that there uh, is kind of a, a little room for uh, interpretation when it comes to um, deviating from the control. One is your assessor uh, and Carly knows this well with her experience as an assessor for the DIPCAC. Um, <clears throat> you have to be able to articulate why you've deviated from that control and how what you're doing instead is either equivalent to or more secure than the body of the control uh, requirement. And then second, your approving body over whoever is making that authorization decision. In the DOD, it's going to be your authorizing official. Um, in other like commercial entities, uh, whoever, whatever organization is approving your control set, uh, and Carly can provide a lot more depth on the CMMC side, um, but those are kind of the two places. So it's really up to the organization to articulate uh, why what they're doing that has deviated from the control is equally as secure or more secure and how well they can articulate that up to their uh, security control um, official that's making the recommendation to the authorizing official. And I mean, so I will counter that with while the DOD has authorizing officials and they can have that risk acceptance, unfortunately, government contractors currently do not really have that capability. Um, now, there are avenues for getting risk mitigation approved, um, but it's like straight up to the DOD CIO office. Um, in my time um, doing these assessments, I think I only had a couple companies that did send up like a memo for it's for making that control what would be considered like not applicable or like accepted based on the mitigations um and i did not see any get approved um so hopefully they're with like cmmc 2.0 and the rulemaking that's coming down like real soon hopefully there is more guidance on things like that. I mean, there have been guidances in regards to like, if you don't have like a requirement implemented, you can have a plan of action and milestone, but there are restrictions to which controls um, and requirements can be on that plan of action or how many. Um, Cause I think when it comes to CMMC, where it can get muddy is that it's, like it's a pass or fail like this um like there is a score attached to it but it's really kind of a pass or fail and the fail comes into play if you if cannot demonstrate that you are securing data 
as per your contract clause. So while it uses a NIST set of requirements, and I'm speaking more towards the 800-171, NIST 800-171 versus CMMC, but um, we like we would assess against the NIST 800-171, but the result of that is, are they compliant with that DFARS contract clause? Um, and so it's there is some, I want to say like level of assessor interpretation of there are certain things that if they're not doing those, that they're then not going to be compliant. Like if you're not doing anything in the incident response set of requirements, then are you truly able to recognize when something has occurred in order to then report it, which is a requirement in the clause? Reporting it is not a requirement in the NIST, but it's a requirement of the clause. But if you don't know what's going on your on your network, then you can't report anything. And so that would then make you non-compliant with the contract clause. So that's where I say it gets a little bit muddy. It's also very like, I, I, wanna, I don't want to say like hypocritical, but it's a very kind of catch-22 double-edged sword of DOD has the ability to um, accept risk of, you know, only having MFA for their privileged users and not MFA for their regular users, but a contractor can't accept the same risk or put in mitigations for the, for the same requirement and pass that requirement. So CMFC is also a lot newer <clears throat> rulemaking mm -hmm. process, right? So I feel like, I mean, and this is just me speculating, but I feel like as that process kind of reaches more of a place of maturity and there is some feedback from our DIB customers that that process will likely evolve uh, as people get to know it and work through the process. 100%. And I think that like even from the beginning before CMMC was starting to get talked about while we were only just starting to assess the 800-171, um, these types of conversations were being had on the government side in order to, is there a process? Where can we, like, could there be allegiance or, like, alleviations, mitigations? What would that even look like? Um, so there are things that they are trying to also put in place. Because at the end of the day, you know, in a sense, like, like, you know, we're the government, we're here to help. But like, you are wanting to ensure, like, you want them to pass because they are doing important work. And like, if they don't pass, that could just, that could then affect the end user who is the warfighter. So um, I think there's, there's a level of that that is also like kind of in play for, from a, from my perspective, as an assessor, that was kind of, that was where my head was at. Like, I want you to pass, but I'm not going to be very, I'm going to be objective. Like the requirement is asking for this. This is what we're looking for. If you can't show me, then I'm sorry, but yeah, not passing. So Megan, you mentioned that working with a partner is usually the first step if you don't know where to go and then taking advantage of your existing tooling and your partner would be able to help you with that. Now, in some cases there may be a Delta and I would assume that may involve purchasing or implementing other solutions or tooling, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to, I guess, failing, since Carly, you're talking about past failing, there are times I'm assuming that people don't pass and then there mm -hmm. has to be some sort of remediation action. Um, but also I wanted to quick, before we get your thoughts on that, I had another thought, which was more, you know, like in school where you studied really hard just for the test and then you just brain dumped the test afterwards. <laughs> I wonder in, in your case of like doing assessments and, and auditing and all that, both between uh, Carly and Megan, have you encountered organizations where they're literally just doing the thing to pass the audit and then they're just like business as usual afterwards and then you know they just prep for the audit again when it comes around like does you know it's a it's a 
a big debate within the InfoSec community whether compliance frameworks actually improve cybersecurity or we're just doing it to pass the audit. I know that's yeah. a loaded question. It, it, it <laughs> is, because uh, there are definitely times that, I, you know, sometimes like we would maybe like chat afterwards or question like, is this really something being done or, and from like, an and especially like from like the perspective of like the assessments I did, like we don't go onto your system. So we're not seeing, like we're not seeing what you're doing. Um, whereas in the DOD, they're going into your system and they're, they're looking. So they'll find it. If you're, if you're like just giving them lip service or like a policy thing, they'll they'll figure it out um so it's definitely i'm sure something that happens but then i think the problem can then there be if you are breached or if you have data exposed or something happens then they're going to come in and question and then you're like you can be in a heap load of like trouble from that perspective. Um, but I know for specific compliance frameworks or audits or assessments, like they want to see like vulnerabilities, for example, like when you do a vulnerability scan, it shows you here are all my criticals, highs, mediums, informationals. They want to see what that looks like over a period of time. So if they don't see like, and there were a couple of times where I'm like, this critical has been here this whole time. What have you done about it? Oh, we didn't do anything. Well, they might like from the, the the audits that I from the assessments that I did, they might pass the requirement, but I am making a note that they're not remediating. Or they might pass the requirement that they're scanning and looking, but they're not going to pass the requirement that talks about remediation and getting rid of these vulnerabilities. Um, and I mean, Megan, I'll let you, I mean, I was going to answer kind of like the previous question, but um, I'll let you, if, I know you have probably thoughts on that as well. I mean, there's no simple answer. Have I seen systems do like, here's a brain dump, like, let's just run up to the assessment and then go back to business as usual. Absolutely. Um, we try to, like generally within the DOD, we're moving away from that, right? The strategic mm -hmm. move to a continuous monitoring ATO was specifically to move away from checkbox security, whereby we just get ready for our assessment and check the box and kind of move on to the next, right? We want to leverage uh, continuous monitoring tools in the environment as much as possible. You know, I keep coming back to Microsoft Purview, but Compliance Manager is uh, one of the solutions there whereby the security posture of the system is monitored over time. So there's really not a run up to a security assessment. It's just your real time snapshot um, and an assessor or an auditor in theory should be able to come into the environment at any given point and pull the implementation details. Uh, now, some things might change, especially where you're looking at like the policies and procedures. That's, I would say there's gonna be the most deviation from what is in policy and what's in practice. But for the most part, uh, with continuous monitoring ATO, we want to be just really grabbing a snapshot and that snapshot could come from anywhere in time. Carly alluded to vulnerability assessments. That's a great example. And that's gonna have you, that's gonna give you a real taste of a policy versus practice for the environment over time because they're telling you that they're doing once monthly remediations based on, you know, it's patch Tuesday, we test our patches, and then by the next Tuesday we have things deployed, or maybe by the following weekend is our deployment window. But then you see a higher critical or even a moderate vulnerability that trails over a period of time. And you're that right there is telling me that what you're preaching and what you have in policy is not what you're practicing because that vulnerability trail is telling a different story. Um, you know, another thing that you look for is there's a lot of shoulder surfing and assessments that goes on. You're telling me that there's MFA uh, both at the enclave level and again at the application level, and that it's uh, tested against the uh, certificate revocation list that DISA publishes. All right, I'd love to see you log in and let's just see. Um, I have this CAC over here that's for a different, you know, this is like a PIV that I use in federal. Can we use that to log in and see if it um, pulls against the CRL, right? So there's ways that assessors can do it. In DOD, it is very real. You're either on the system in a read-only capacity or you're doing a lot of um, shoulder surfing. So 
I would say yes. And in particular, I want to point out the Army actually recently made a statement publicly that they were moving away from checkbox security um, and making a hard push toward a secure um, all-time posture, right? So the um, RMF framework is a wonderful framework, but how can we implement this in practice so that this is like part of our daily operating procedure and it's not just policy that this is actually something that is in practice every day that we can grab a real time snapshot from uh, at any given point. And I have to say, like, I know that just because of the technology investments that have been made across the DOD and in particular in the Army that they are using first party tools to grab those best practice and what we would recommend. That's some great advice for really any company is to just have that continuous monitoring going. When I, I love the, the terminology checkbox check security, I think there's a perception, Andy, you talked about in the cybersecurity community that that's all that's happening versus that kind of continuous approach. But when you pose the question as do compliance frameworks or do audits meaningfully improve security, I was thinking in my head what popped into my head, and I, I don't even know why, was around like food safety requirements, like health requirements for restaurants. And mm -hmm. a lot of people like in that industry, they may not know that this is actually dangerous or this is unsafe or you shouldn't store mm -hmm. raw meat above fresh vegetables in the cooler. And that's why you have standards bodies, experts create those policies so that you don't have to have that individual knowledge. We've created it at an industry level and we're just checking your application of it. Now, do you have some restaurants that are only going to try to come up to speed right before the inspector shows up? Sure. But I think Megan and Carly talked about scenarios where you can still tell. And to just take that analogy further, you may have everyone doing all the right things in front of the inspector, but if they go in the cooler, they may observe the food isn't properly labeled with expiration dates or times it was opened or whatever. And so you can try to sweep some of it under the rug or, or show up well that day, but there's going to be a trail of things that if you haven't been practicing it all along, it will come out eventually. If people will get sick or whatever, you'll get compromised. And so I, I see some kind of analogies there, some commonalities between those two concepts. And I think absolutely it, there, you're going to have it both ways where some are just trying to meet the audit at the moment, um, or some are going to have that continuous mindset approach, but you still have to have those standards so that we all agree on these are the practices we should all be working toward. So, um, I just thought that was a really interesting conversation. So yeah, and a couple things, sorry to cut you off. I spent 15 yeah. years in hospitality, food and beverage before <laughs> coming into it. So I'm like, I don't know if you looked at my LinkedIn profile or what, but no. that <laughs> analogy was like spot on. Like, mm -hmm. yes, I agree completely. I love mm -hmm. it. Carly, mm -hmm. you were going to say something. Sorry. No, well, I was going to say it, it goes back to also like that whole practice what you preach thing. Like, so you're right. Like the person who is unloading the truck and putting the meat in the cooler might not know that the regulation says this, but how were they taught to pack the cooler? Mm -hmm. And so there's a level of like education, training and awareness of your user base, because like a lot of times, too, when it comes to like any audit or assessment, you might have the policy written, you might have some like the technology put in place, but if your user base does not know what they're supposed to be doing or if they're not regularly taught or checked, like the end user could be the person who fails a requirement or makes like an observation is what we used to kind of, what we would call them. Like if like you've got the policy, you've got the practice, we're, we're, I'm just letting you know that we saw people not following this. And the end user is always going to be your weakest, like, link in the security chain. Um, and, like, when you're talking about, like, that analogy, it kind of made me think of, like, you know, when we would go through, um, like, the CCRIs or another type of audit that they have in the government. Um, and you're not supposed to leave your... CAC in your computer. That is just a best practice from a physical security, information security. Don't leave your CAC in your computer. And people, like, they would walk around, and if they saw someone, like, and our security guards would walk around taking people's CACs, 
and pulling them from computers and then they'd have to come back and get them. Or like during an audit, we've got like our folks like walking around making sure because that while your IT team who prepares for the audit is being assessed, they're also observing everything else. Like there were different things that I saw from like a physical security standpoint or, you know, I got access to the people in a company's sock. And so they told me like, you know, um, something was manager or it's manager specific. So they didn't really have anything in their policy. So I went and talked to an analyst and I said, which one of those people back there is your manager? And like, so I talked to, to verify and validate that their policy is being followed. Um, so you never know. Um, so the continuous monitoring and the like not checkbox security is the best practice for sure. I love how both of you, I, I know because I used to be military that you're working with the DOD because you use so many acronyms. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know, sorry. For those... Who are listening if you don't know what a cat card is common access card which is the military or um, government id that is issued with a chip in it that you have to use in order to access your workstation and so what carly is saying is you know pra practice and policy is to not leave that in when you leave the workstation just like you know you're supposed to lock your screen or whatever um when you leave and so um yeah. Anyways, that, I just thought that was kind of funny because both of you are like, you'll say these acronyms and in my head, I'm like, what does that mean? What does that stand for? <laughs> um, I do want to go back. What CCRI is, I'm going to probably butcher it and don't like, I couldn't remember what that like assessment, even the acronym was. It's like the something command readiness inspection. That's right. Cyber. Yeah. Right. See? <laughs> Didn't brain dump it for any of our assessors out there. And I just want to add really quickly that when we talk about like a run up to the assessment and a brain dump, like there's a pre assessment or a self assessment process that goes down. So organizations going through this should never get like, quote unquote, caught with their pants down. Like you should have yeah. it. I mean, and it's in some cases it's make or break. It's your ability to, it's your authority to operate or not. And then if you don't, if you fail in the DOD, they issue something called a DATO which is a disconnection, meaning that shut her down. Like we don't trust your ability to do this securely. And so it's, oh. there's not enough, I would say importance or emphasis sometimes placed on the process of GRC, even though it's like checkbox security, but fail that and find out, right? It's <laughs> that kind of like goes back to the F around find out, like fail that. <laughs> and see how thrilled, like see how quickly GRC becomes a priority for your CTO, your CIO, 100%. your CEO, very quickly. Yeah, very. And, and to follow up on that, because I literally before this call just got off of a call with a customer that I got pulled into who is having an issue where they failed an audit and now they're in this, you know, put out the fire mode and let's loop in everybody. So. I was curious more from your experience, either one of you, when a specific item is failed or or the whole thing is failed, what's the time frame generally of like getting that remediated? And then also, if it's short, which I don't know how long these, these guys had, but it seemed like it's a very short time. They're like, we need to get this done by the end of the month how well can that really be remediated? Because some of these organizations can be large, some of the processes can be cumbersome. You're literally ripping and removing different policies or shoving things in to just pass the audit or pass this control. Like how much time do you usually get? And then in your experience, like how well is it really done when they remediate it? Um, so, I mean, the kind of long and short is assessment audit dependent. They all have their own um, process and timeline for post-assessment activities. Um, a lot of times there's something that like assessors will want to see something like 30 days, maybe 60 days. Um, and even if it's something that's going to take a long time, they want to see that you're taking the steps to make those changes. Um, like for the assessments that I did, um, you know, you would have to give us your plan of action and milestones within I can't remember if it was two weeks or 30 days, something like that. Because um, we like you had 
And some will also have like a grace period. If there was something that would be like a quick fix, like a policy change or flipping a switch, you might have a grace period to enact those things. And then an assessor comes in to like recheck it. Um, but we would, if somebody failed or found, were found non-compliant, um, we would require a plan of action, a milestone, and then we would assess them read. Cause like that assessment cycle was like every three years, but we would come back a year later to reassess, to see if they did the things that they needed to become compliant with the contract. Um, and if they still were not, I don't even know if we had a process for that. Um, cause like this was like brand, brand new assessing and a new team like that when I was doing it. So we were coming up within reason, um, what those actions were. Um, but typically if you tell someone, like give someone like in contracting, they call it a car, a corrective action report or requirement, something along those lines. Um, and there are different levels and depending on the level, like it's putting, like Megan was saying, you get like a DATO. This is like, they get like a scarlet letter fail on their company name. So any contracts they are trying to negotiate or renegotiate, they could lose. Um, so for that, like we helped, like we met with them kind of regularly to see what their progress was. Um, but not like, and so there's typically that. I mean, Megan, I don't know if you experienced anything different when it came to like ATOs. Yeah. So I take everything back to the quantitative analysis. So when you get your kind of authorization decision, uh, you get a risk score and that score is dependent upon whether the, so it's all based on the vulnerability or it's not binary in DOD like pass or fail, but you get a score associated and that score is based on what type of uh, control it is. If it's a technical control, it potentially is going to have a CVSS score, common vulnerability scoring system. Uh, STIGs have a different scoring system, common configuration scoring system. That's a NIST standard. They publish the algorithm that's used and it's dependent upon the, uh, basically the different vectors of attack that, uh, pro like likelihood or probability of exploitation. Um, and then basically what is seen in the wild. So something that has a very high score then uh, it's it's all impact based, right? So I like to use the example of um, you, Andy served, Carly, you served. I don't know, Adam, if you know a DoD warning banner. So when you land on a DoD website, there has to be by regulation a DoD warning banner. Okay, this is a Category One finding or a high severity finding. If you don't have it, that's a Cat One strike against you, but it carries a risk score of zero. Right. So even if it's because it's mandatory, you got to have it it's regulation, but it, you're not it doesn't actually present a risk. Right. So it's all it's relative. It's based on that. You can have an ATO that has a very like we're very opposed to risk. We don't like it in our system. And I, they see cat one or they see critical or high finding and they say definitely disconnect. But then if you unpack that a little bit, you're like, OK, mm -hmm. but it's it, there's a risk score of zero. We actually still got a hundred percent or a hundred percent is highly unlikely, but we're still in the nineties. So we're very secure. It's just this one thing that we need to fix. So definitely we'll submit a poem. So, but then, you know, turn that around and you might have a very robust security posture, but there was recently a zero day released that has, it's a critical in nature and it has a very high CVSS score that remains, there's really no way to mitigate it. It's a remote exploitable uh, administrative level vulnerability in your environment. And it's very likely that you're gonna get maybe a weak turnaround to resolve that or a disconnection. So it's very relative to the quantitative analysis of the risk that's in play currently in the environment. So just like with most things in InfoSec, it depends. <laughs> I was gonna, it depends. I was yeah. gonna crack a joke <laughs> because Carly answered it in a way where she didn't say it depends, but she said in so many words, it depends. And I just loved how diplomatically you put it. And I was taking a mental note that 
I'm going to go to the transcript and take how you put it because you said something like, well, it's dependent on this, this, and this. And it's like, that's perfect. I'm going to steal that because I hate <laughs> saying it depends, but my goodness, a lot of things, it depends. It depends. Exactly. <laughs> and yes. especially when you get into, I don't want to say more ambiguous type assessments, but there are some where like, like Megan said, you have cat one findings, but you have a very low risk score. So, I mean, that, you know, that gives it that quantitative thing. But like with CM or with the DFARS assessments, you have a score, but it's kind of ambiguous because you can score like the lowest score is like a negative 231. So like 110, it's not zero to 110. It goes like super negative. So there's a lot of different dependencies and that's where things can get confusing. But when you have something that's in a sense, cut and dry, what type of category is it? What is the risk? That's what makes things a little bit easier. Um, but nobody likes to see those cat one. They like to color them red and red's a bad yeah. color. <laughs> we don't want a colorful <laughs> assessment report. We always no. go back to the question of, because you don't want to protect a $5 bike with a $10 lock. So if the question is like, is this a good lock? Well, I don't know. What kind of bike do you have, right? It's so relative. Right. All right. So let's shift gears a little bit because I do want to talk a little bit about data protection for our listeners because both of you guys Favorite. are also experts in data protection. And what I think on a lot of organizations, CISOs, security teams' minds today is really this AI revolution, large language models like ChatGPT. Uh, we have implemented it into Bing, both commercial and enterprise. Uh, one of the most longstanding GA products that we have, Pilot, which is great for you know, putting in and writing your own code. And recently I actually talked mm -hmm. to a friend of mine who worked at Apple who said, hey, they can't use Copilot there because it's proprietary code and they don't want you know Microsoft to have access to it or something like that. So I want to get your thoughts on just in general data protection and how, you know, ways that we can protect orgs from data exfiltration into these large language models, preventing their data from training the underlying models and, and getting released, stuff like that. So yeah, I'm going to so, say something. I was yeah, going to say something real short, and I because I know Megan, um, especially with like the GitHub Copilot stuff, probably has some strong thoughts. But it all comes down to: Do you even know what data you have in your environment? Do you know it? Are you protecting what needs to be protected? Because that is like the fundamental, um, and that is a lot of people don't necessarily know. And when we talk about these compliance frameworks, they're there to protect the data. But people don't necessarily know what or where or have it protected. So that, I mean, my long-ish short answer is, do you know your data and are you protecting it? Encrypting it, so, like siloing it off in some... Um, not necessarily like an encrypted, but a, you know, access only type in like library or place. But and that's where it starts. Carly, I want to just piggyback off of what you said, because it sounds like Megan's got some thoughts here. But when She's I talk to that. security leaders about this, the guidance I give them is the tools to do this already all exist. And for organizations that have already done their homework, this really didn't represent any net new risk to them. Because if you're already sensitivity labeling your most sensitive things and you're preventing those from crossing certain data boundaries, you've already done all of that. You can already say this doesn't leave the enterprise environment. This can't be pasted on an arbitrary website. If you've done that work, you've nothing to do. The, the folks who are having the biggest problems and are having to use the very blunt objects to solve this or the sledgehammer approach, as I call it. Are, are the folks who haven't done that. They don't know their data. So what they have to do instead is we're just going to do a network level block of like chat GPT or whatever, you know, the flavor of the month is because they don't have the ability to use that scalpel approach, that surgical approach. They have to just do it all because they have no concept of it. And if you've done your homework on information protection, data security, data loss prevention, 
this isn't a big deal to you. You already have all the tools in place. At least that's been my thesis to this point. Yeah, I think, I mean, that is very much correct. Like for those who have already started down this information protection journey, um, it's going to be a lot easier and they're going to get more warm and fuzzies going into the AI world. Um, I think one thing to note um, is that like if you're using like a Bing Enterprise Copilot or you're using Security Copilot or M365 Copilot or something that is for your tenant, it's not coming back to Microsoft to train the overall large language. It's training your company's Copilot large language model. Um, but that being said, if you're not identifying and protecting sensitive information, Copilot will find it and expose it to any user that's looking for it. So like if passports, for example, that's PII that needs to be protected should only be seen by users in your HR directory group. Andy's not. Andy goes, show me some passports. If you don't have that identified and protected, like it's going to show all the passports that it can find that are available in the network. Big yikes. <laughs> It's the big yikes. It, we went through this when in, and I'm going to date myself a little bit, but when Delve first came out, and I don't think it's called that today, it's just SharePoint Search. But at the time, there was this new Microsoft 365 app called Delve, and it was a way to search all of your M365 content. And I was in enterprise IT at the time, and I worked a lot with our executive admin support. And this gentleman came running up to me. If his hair could have been on fire, it would have been saying, oh my gosh, we have a huge problem. We have a huge security gap. This stuff is all exposed. And of course, as I dug into it, it was no, that is set to accessible to everyone. The system's doing what it's supposed to do. If I search for it mm -hmm. and it's marked as wide open sharing, it's going to find it. So what we really need to do is go back and do our homework on oversharing and permissioning and those sorts of things as well, because the system has the ability to surface. It's not designed to do that, but it can do that. And right. it's like deja vu for me, because it's that same conversation over again, where we have to go back to just do the basics, know your data, protect your data. Uh, make sure you're not, you're preventing oversharing, data leakage, all of those things. And you're going to have a much better, like you said, warm fuzzies with it. You guys are doing Megan. a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> okay. Megan, let's hear your thoughts. I, I love hearing your thoughts. I have a soapbox about this. Uh, so I where, will hand where it to, to you. Begin. That's normally my job on the show, but here's the soapbox. Where to begin? It. So, okay. Copilot, copilot, copilot. Uh, copilot is... Think about like a your um, authorization boundary. Like what what's the savviest Microsoft term? I think they call it your compliance boundary, your trust boundary. So Copilot obviously is based on large language model. It's OpenAI did a great job trained up large language model to recognize plain language uh, prompts. Right for the purpose of Microsoft Copilot, for all Copilots, we take a copy of that, and that copy gets to correlate with the tools that are relative to the copilot, right? So security copilot gets access to your security tools. M365 copilot gets access to your M365 modern work solutions. What it doesn't get to do when you play with, when you use your prompts and you get commands back, what becomes uh, relative that that large language model copy for your environment, what it gets to correlate against is the data you've created from use of your copilot, right? You, what you're not doing is retraining the large language model. That is the job of the folks at OpenAI or whoever is, you know, building the LLM. It's not the end user participating in enhancing that large language model. That's because if you think about an LLM as a system, it's separate. It's the folks who develop that system, it's not the end users, right? So it's a little bit confusing in that regard. And it's like, we have to break it down to the foundation, foundational understanding of what is AI at the end of the day. It's really just a correlation engine that can understand our plain language. That's the whole concept of large language model, right? So what it gets to correlate against isn't the prompts that we have used to 
uh, leverage the AI. It is simply the data that we've created using those prompts, which was already our pre-existing data that existed in our trust boundary or our tenant. Now, where it gets really interesting is someone we work with used this analogy the other day, and I think it's like really, really cool, right? Our GUI that we interact with on a daily basis, our M365 platform is we're, we're in a room, our trust boundary, it's a dark room and our M365 platform, we've like lit a match. We can see what we can see if we remember where to search for it. And Copilot is gonna flip the lights on, right? So if, to Carly's point, in our environment, our lowest hanging fruit sensitive information types like social security numbers, credit card numbers, bank account numbers, routing numbers, which may or may not be present in your environment. You know who would know? Microsoft Purview would know really quickly, be able to tell you through the data classification service that comes out of the box. But if these things aren't protected, labeled and protected in your environment, then I as an end user now, I'm gonna be able to prompt, use my just plain language prompt in my Copilot and be able to say, show me, <laughs> Show me all the bank account numbers in my Show me your money. Like, you know, mm -hmm. however you can consider to ask that, but it might be inadvertent, you know, like if you have customers mm -hmm. that have sensitive data, uh, like DFARS, good example, if that happens to be within your intent, you could put in something that is a completely um, an unintentional, like not malicious prompt whatsoever. And you're bringing back sensitive data all of a sudden that you're like, you might not even realize it's a problem because you don't really even know that that should be protected data that has only like a need to know capacity associated with it, right? So it's, if I take that data, that DFARS data, for example, and I start creating PowerPoints from that, then we're expanding, we're extrapolating the presence of that data in the environment unbeknownst to anybody, right? So some things will be very obvious, like, oh shoot, I don't think I should have access to this. Bank account numbers. I. Carly orders some Girl Scout cookies. My daughter's a Girl Scout and we're selling Girl Scout cookies. And she says, here's my uh, credit card number, just, you know, whenever you can get them to me. And that that credit card number then becomes fair game for anyone in the environment. And let's say you're just searching your OneDrive, like, oh shoot, like what kind of credit card numbers do I have, you know, in my environment? And it has the potential to query back for the entire environment. So if we're gonna light up Copilot, which I think every organization should, data governance is it's a foundational element it's required but what is so awesome is like microsoft had the consideration to put truly the uh horse before the cart as opposed to by vice versa with the out of the box functionality out of microsoft purview because when i tell you out of the box i truly mean you log into the purview dashboard you go into the data classification service and there are 314 sensitive information types which it sounds like you guys have covered on your podcast before out of the box, it can light up all PII, PHI, clear text credentials, all the kind of things that are the lowest hanging fruit. The, those are the easiest things to protect, right? So it's a great, great starting point. I'll get down off my soapbox because I, I said no. a lot there. Carly, um, did you have anything to add? <laughs> well, no, I mean, so you started touching on it when you talked, because I was going to say, like, pretty much every customer that is in Microsoft has access to turn on those sensitive information types in purview. And the biggest thing is many people don't know, and you can just turn them on just to figure out like, and start identifying it. You don't even have to put labels or policies attached to that sensitive information type, but you can't even start putting DLP policies for specific things until you turn on those sensitive information types and it'll just start identifying and telling you where it all is. So that's like step one. And a lot of times, like a lot of cut, like, um, conversations that we have with customers, especially as they're starting this journey, um, don't even realize that they already have that. And like, I was sitting in a customer and he's like, well, what are we doing? <laughs> like I, he's like two weeks. I want, I want to start seeing what I got. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's, I mean, and that's machine learning. That's AI already kind of built into the products that a lot of customers already have. So they're probably already using some versioning of it. I think, you know, like we've, there's a fear mongering of open AI and you're, you're training the model, but like Megan said, you're not training the model you are if you're training anything you're training it's it's essentially should just be called like you know 
company copilot because mm-hmm. that's what it is. It's that's it's only touching the company. Now that being said, if you go to Bing, like not Bing, uh, like your company Bing Enterprise, if you're just in normal Bing entering stuff into there, that's going back to what's that kind of free and open model training stuff. Mm-hmm. So, and one thing I like too, Megan, you talked about not putting the cart before the horse. I love that copilot from Microsoft 365 not only is aware of sensitivity labels, it can use them. So Mm -hmm. you talked about, hey, I can take a Word document and turn it into a PowerPoint. So let's say that Word document is labeled confidential and I have access to it. I should have access to it. And I want to create a PowerPoint based upon that content of it. If I do that with Copilot for Microsoft 365, that resulting output, that PowerPoint document, it inherits the same label automatically. So when you do all the homework here and you put all the pieces in place, you get to carry it with you automatically. And that's, again, kind of putting that forethought in there of building the solution to work in actual environments and and the needs they have to protect that data moving forward because a lot of what generative AI does is it generates content. And if that content Mm -hmm. is based upon sensitive content, then the resulting content should probably be sensitive too. And that's already part of the platform. Yeah. And I want to just like double tap on that really quickly because there's like, I think a disconnect. It also inherits not just the sensitivity label, but the rights management services behind that. Right. So if I have access to a document, but read only, I don't have access to do anything else, copy, print, et cetera. I'm not even going to be able to query that back with Copilot. So it's very insightful in that regard. And that's why the data protection piece, like for our DOD customers in particular, and I know this podcast is broader than that, but like if you're thinking about a Copilot investment, get your house in order now. That's like the most important thing that you can do to be very data aware and have security at the forefront of your AI journey as an organization. We're saying the same thing in enterprise. We're telling Mm -hmm. them, hey, even if you don't have this yet, get your house in order. Because when the edict comes down from your board or from your executives or whomever runs the show, you're ready. Yeah, I love love that statement, get your house in order, because I was telling a new uh, security specialist that I'm working with on how this stuff really works and getting a data inventory, getting a inventory of every devices. That's the first thing. Like, how do you, how do you know what to protect if you, um, if you don't have an inventory? And so I use the analogy of our house. Like, why do we have locks on our house? It's to protect the things inside our house. But what if our house was robbed, what is the first thing that you're going to go check generally? Like what's the most important thing? And mm-hmm. is that secure, right? Like my, some of my stuff is in a safe within the house, right? So that's even more segregated. And so um, getting your house in order, right? Like making sure that you have the locks around the things that are most important to you. And you know, if you have a breach, where is the first thing that you're going to check to see if that was exfiltrated, right? Mm-hmm. No, and I was going to, wanted to, in a sense, triple tap on, <laughs> <laughs> piggyback from Megan to Adam, now to Andy and to me, but, um, you know, the whole cart before the horse, like Microsoft has built and is developing the co-pilots with security in mind. So as Megan said, like, and as we've talked about, the labels will follow what you generate, the rights management follow it. But Copilot will not be that kind of backdoor to get sensitive information into the prompt response. So if there, if you are asking and talking to Copilot, even if you have the rights, like it's not going to put something in there that's not meant to be copied and pasted. It's going to point you to where you can find that information, but it's not going to kind of, again, give you that loophole to pull something out of Copilot that you can't, that you wouldn't be able to pull from a Word document or from like a PowerPoint presentation. So those securities are following it. Like as we tell our customers, we are building things and developing and advancing with data security in mind. So trying to keep our house in order so that you can keep your house in order. I want to end on the fact that Carly, Megan, both of you guys also have a podcast, which we're going to record right after this, but definitely check them out because their podcast is a little bit of a different vibe. It's called Cocktails and Socktails. And so I just want to thank both of you for your time today. 
it was an amazing conversation. This was probably one of the best. I certainly learned a ton, and I hope that our listeners learned a ton as well. Yeah, thanks for having us. Now let's go have a yeah. drink. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching, as always, and listening. Our contact information, as long as as well as Carly and Megan's, will be in the show notes and some links to uh, some of the topics that we talked about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.